Hi everyone, welcome back again to the New England Wireless and Steam Museum. Today we have part two of a special on the coreless valve technology, what made it so different from the other valves and why it was such a big step forward. We're in store for some technical information today. We did a video just the other day, a kind of an overview of what the system looks like, but now we're going to get into a bit more about the technical details of what it is that makes it so different. So right off the top, uh, as we head down there to the Corliss engine, I can say that it's all about controlling exactly how much steam flows into each end of the cylinder during every single stroke. The original slide valve technology, the older technology, had no timing control over how much steam flowed into the cylinder. It all came down to the, the pressure or flow restriction through uh, the admission valve or through the, the main steam valve. That was their only means of controlling how much steam flowed in. The actual timing, the duration of admission is more of a technical term, uh, was always exactly the same. And the cordless valve changed that by controlling the the duration of steam admission. So we have a little uh, diagram here on the wall that shows a little bit of information about uh, several of the different technologies. So you have a little bit of uh, reading that you could do here about that, um, but I want to get into it directly. We have a number of different demonstrations I can do here today to not only show you the engine itself, but show you exactly what's going on inside. For anybody not familiar with it before, we're looking specifically at the, uh, the valve gear here and how its motion is different from anything else. All right, here we are, folks. Just want to show you a little bit about the motion of the coreless valves and just quite uh, the sequence of operation that it's going through. You'll see everything here rocking back and forth and moving just to give you some ideas of what the motion looks like. And then moving forward, we will get into some more of the technical details of quite what everything's doing. As a quick overview, we have an admission valve both here and on that side for each end of the cylinder and an exhaust valve down at the bottom, exhausting again from the respective end of the cylinder. Dash pot here, which is nothing more than a vacuum chamber. Uh, vacuum is pulled in that chamber when this gets raised up and then just wants to snap that closed very quickly. So let's take a quick look at what that motion looks like. Now, if I take a quick run over it and move the governor just a little bit, you'll see this linkage move just a little bit, and uh, you'll notice that the duration of uh, lift, basically the degree to which these cranks raise, will be lessened immediately. And I can say this would simulate a situation where the engine was under a lesser load, thereby decreasing the duration of steam admission to the cylinder. So there it is, just a quick overview of, of the effect that the governor has by moving this crank, pushing this linkage over, it decreases the amount of time that steam is admitted to each end of the cylinder. Let's dig a little deeper into what that actually means. Here we are in the Mays building at the museum, and we have a teaching model, a salesman's model of the Corliss engine, uh, back from the late 1800s. This model actually works quite well 
to demonstrate exactly what that coreless valve uh, achieves. You see the cutaway here, and let's get in a little closer so everyone can see it a bit. Um, we have the admission valve here for one end of the cylinder and the port for that. Admission valve at the opposite end of the cylinder, with, again with its port, and you see the internal mechanism of the valve opening and closing there. And a piston, cylinder, and exhaust valves on both ends. Let's give it a turn and see what happens. The whole idea is that steam is admitted very quickly in a precisely metered amount, um, or for a specific duration really, it's not metered, uh, other than duration, and then shut off very quickly to allow a, that precise amount of steam to expand within the cylinder, achieving virtually zero PSI by the time it gets to the end of its stroke. Um, you know, giving off as much of its energy as possible uh, before being exhausted. So, you know, controlling that duration is really what this all comes down to. So you'll recall that snapping motion of the dash pots and that's the exact same thing going on here. You'll see the valve open through a very short amount of motion and then snap back closed again. There it is opening and snapping back closed again very quickly. Same exact thing as the other end of the cylinder. Um, the duration is, is a little off in this model. You can see that it snaps closed much quicker on one end than on the other. It really comes down to just a little adjustment, but nonetheless, the concept is there. We're here again in the steam building, and I've got a couple little diagrams here that I want to draw to uh, show you exactly what's going on. And here is a representation of the typical slide valve uh, type uh, setup that you would have. We displayed it a little bit in some of the other videos uh, with the, the system with the three slots, the steam chest that would be full of steam at all times, the cylinder here, and the ports connecting to one end of the cylinder, the exhaust port in the middle, and the admission port or the flow port to the opposite end of the cylinder. I have here three separate versions of the slide valve, each with a little set a different profile. Um, these would have what's from a technical standpoint known as uh, additional lead and lap on uh, them here. Of course, something like that would be sitting right there, connected to the valve eccentric and moved by the eccentric on the crankshaft back and forth, admitting steam to one end of the cylinder or the other. And again, a quick overview, if this were displaced like this, um, steam from the steam chest would flow down through that end, push the piston this way, while the exhaust is vented here, through the back side of that door and out the exhaust port. And then as it approached this end of the cylinder, this would begin to shift back the opposite direction, reversing itself, admitting steam from the steam chest through this end, again, pushing the piston the opposite direction down to the opposite side while this is exhaust. Now the difference between these three and what really makes the coreless valve different is that the geometry of all these things is established by the engine builder when the engine is built and can't be changed while it's in use. You see, the door, the, the uh, slide valve or the D valve, is always connected to that valve eccentric at the same time. And all of the geometry here is the same. So on every single stroke, the amount of time that you have here on the lead or lap that the other one has that this doesn't have, uh, and the amount of flow into each end of the piston is the same in duration for every single stroke. Now you see here with this, uh, this configuration we have uh, some lead here, it's covering the steam port for longer. So the, uh, the valve has to travel more, they have a little bit more time in between, uh, a little delay in the opening for um, the steam admitted to either end of the cylinder on this. 
And then again, further with this one, a bit of lap in between um, the amount of time that uh, the steam is contained within the cylinder and allowed to expand is increased uh, with that lap there on the inside, this little bit of additional width. And like I say, all of that is established by the engine builder and can't be changed in operation. We have a 100% connection between that and uh, the movement of the piston. So the duration of admission is always the same for every stroke, no matter what the load is or anything. The only thing that can be done, and the effect of the governor in a slide valve uh, engine, is to slow down the flow of steam into that cylinder. I realize we're a little bit technical with all of this, but I want to show a quick little diagram of what that looks like from a technical perspective, and you'll see immediately the difference and why Corliss was so genius. If you can imagine the flow starting off slow, 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 well, actually, the first thing that we can do is show it on a, a plumbing type valve. I have here a gate valve and a ball valve. Uh, people might be interested in this. If you can imagine this uh, valve here moving, it starts to uncover the port just a little bit here. Steam starts to flow into that chamber, starting to push the piston down toward me. And as it increases up to full opening, flow increases through there, pushes that piston more, and then that motion has to reverse where it starts closing again. To look at a gate valve here, we would see, ignoring the amount of turning that I have to do, that I could open that valve and it starts opening very slowly, you know, opening up to full, full open and then closing back down again. And that cycle would repeat time after time after time, you know, going through this open and close motion over the course of time. Quite differently, a ball valve opens very quickly and closes very quickly. Opens very quickly and closes very quickly, and that's exactly what the Corvus valve does. If we look at it here in a diagram, I see I have flow on the y-axis here and time on the x-axis. A typical D-valve would have some amount of a, a waveform like this, and then the um, the valve lead would give you a little bit of dwell time in the middle, and then it would reverse to the opposite end of the cylinder and repeat again. That cycle would be exactly the same on every stroke of the cylinder and can't be changed. Again, the only thing that they can change is the amount of flow into the steam chest at all, which would lower that peak a bit, but otherwise the timing would be exactly the same. Now on a cordless valve, you get that admission, the rapid admission and closure, and then the steam is allowed to expand and do its job within the cylinder, and you can vary the duration of admission. That's exactly what it does. And immediately you'll see the difference. Corvus valve opens, stays open for some you know, duration of admission, and then closes again. Does its job, steam expanding through that time, opens for the opposite end of the cylinder, closes. Now, depending on the load on the engine, the duration will be longer. So you might have a situation where steam is admitted for a, a greater duration of the stroke, and it can be changed on every single stroke of the engine. For anyone that's a real technical out there, you'll notice this is something similar to uh, an analog electrical signal. This is something very similar to a digital electrical signal. And a step further, this is the original, something very, very common in modern day electronics, the original pulse width modulation. Absolute genius, done entirely mechanically, and something that survives to this day as a principle of modern day electronics, varying the signal in that square type wave, analog, digital. It's what makes Corvus different. We have one more uh, demonstration of the flow through those valves that some other people can relate to. Let's do that quickly and we'll be done with this explanation. One quick little demonstration here. 
Uh, I've got the water hose hooked up to this, and you can imagine, like I said, about the valve opening very slowly, delivering its flow, and then having to close back down again. It's something very simple. Um, we're constricted here in this demonstration by the small hose, so unfortunately the flow situation is not quite what it could be. If I happen to have a uh, fire engine here, it would be a very different story. But you see here, just a second, we'll try this out. I'll switch to the ball valve, and I think you'll be able to understand it immediately. With the typical slide valve situation, we'd have to open very slowly. Open, 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 we get the flow out of it. Close it back down again on every single stroke. Let's switch that out to a ball valve. So here we are with the ball valve. And I will say it's not an exact correlation because we have our flow limited by the garden hose in this particular circumstance. The whole idea with the coreless valve is you're trying to meter exactly how much steam, which is effectively potential energy, is admitted to the cylinder and then stop it, stop the flow as quickly as possible to let the steam expand in the cylinder and do its job. The big difference, as we've seen in the diagram, is that the valve can be closed off very quickly and change how much steam is admitted to the cylinder. In this case, similar to a ball valve, the coreless valve can open very quickly, delivering exactly how much steam you need, and then snap back closed again. Open on the next stroke for exactly how much you need, and close back down again. There's no steam wasted. You see in uh, the gate valve situation I just showed, the spray of water that was going everywhere. If you can imagine that as being wasted energy, I know it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. I wish we had more water flow here to show you exactly what I'm talking about. But the whole idea of being able to open very quickly, meter exactly how much you want, and then potentially on the very next stroke, open and then close very quickly because your load has diminished. So there's your difference right there between a coreless valve and a typical slide valve. Just the ability to open and close quickly and for defined length of time. It's a major difference. We hope everybody's enjoyed the video. Thanks for joining us. We hope you come back again and see the videos leading up to Steam Up this year on October 3rd. You can see it right here on YouTube. Please like and share the videos. Thanks again for watching.